Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the Epistle to the Romans verse by verse, but I've decided to take a temporary departure from that study to address an issue that I was asked about on the comment thread of one of my previous videos. I was asked to talk about the difference between redemption and salvation. Now, there's a number of ways to do that, but I decided that I wanted to, in order to do that, I wanted to direct your attention to the first four verses of 1 Timothy chapter 2, where that the exhortation begins with the fact that we should be in prayer. We're told that we should pray always, that we are to pray for all men, that we should pray for everybody, even for kings and all those in authority. And this will no doubt hit a nerve among uh, many of us today who take a critical approach to uh, some particular politicians uh, who don't consider it beneficial to pray for leaders in government when the powers that be are ordained of God, when God has determined who our leaders are and for what purpose, that purpose being for His best as well as ours. Our God is directing the course of men and the course of the nations, and He's doing that according to His will. And we know that the powers that be are ordained of God, therefore our leaders are ordained of God. And to suggest that we speak in disparaging terms and, and we, we refuse to pray for them is, well, it, it's tantamount to saying, we disagree with those whom God has put in office, those that He's put in charge. The reason they're, they're over us, whether we, we know that or not from God's standpoint, is that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Contrary to popular opinion, it isn't a Christian who ought to be organizing a, an overthrow of the government. Daniel was taken captive you know, by the Babylonians and he served faithfully uh, in the Babylonian government. The Persians came in and took the city and Daniel became a faithful servant in the Persian gov government. It, it wasn't his job, wasn't Daniel's job to decide who was in authority or whether they should be there or not. It was Daniel's job to serve the Lord. We are ambassadors for Christ. We're to pray for the leaders that God has put in office, and our prayer is to be such that we may lead a peaceable, quiet life with respect to the government. The very government that Paul prayed for was part of the state authorities that put him in prison and eventually beheaded him. But he didn't speak against the government, for those were God's men carrying out God's will. It was God's men who beheaded Paul. It was the government that God had ordained that put him to death. God has told us that praying for those in authority leads to our living a quiet, peaceful life in godliness and honesty. And this is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now listen carefully. Regeneration has to do with dead creatures. Salvation, rescue, deliverance has to do with living creatures. God's people are dead and they need to be regenerated. They need to be born again. They died in Adam and then they died in their own sin. Now, and I've spent some time discussing that in, in detail in past videos, but that's not the focus of this teaching. The, the fact is, God's people need to be regenerated. They need to be regenerated because they're dead. Once they're regenerated, however, they need to be saved, rescued, rescued from sin, rescued from doubt, rescued from fear, rescued from the fear of death. And that rescue, that, that saved, has to do with living creatures. Nobody can be saved who isn't already spiritually alive. That's my point. My sheep hear my voice, 
and I give them eternal life, said our Lord. Why don't you believe me? Because you're not my sheep. Now, I didn't say this. God did. John chapter 10. If you're not already one of his sheep, born by the word of God, born by the will of God, then you cannot be saved. You cannot believe. You don't believe to be regenerated. You believe because you have been regenerated. However, once regenerated, you do believe to be delivered. You trust Him. If you're not delivered from fear, you're not trusting Christ. If you're afraid to die, you're not trusting your Lord. Any fear, any problem that you have in your life, any disaster in your eyes that is that has come that, that seems to be almost unsolvable is nothing if you trust Him. All you have to do is trust Him. All fear, it goes. All doubt goes. All difficulty goes. I trust Him. He can do with me as He pleases. That's how we're rescued. That is how we are saved. But that's not how we're redeemed. Redemption or regeneration is the work of God. Salvation or rescue is also His work by implanting faith in us that we trust Him. We've all been given a measure of faith. Folks, the, the Word says that He came unto His own. He came to deliver His people from their sins. They're already His people. Those are the ones that He's saving. He's saving His people. He's not saving Satan's people and making them His people. They're already His people. Thou shalt call His name Emmanuel, for He shall save His people from their sins. They are regenerated. They are His people. He did that. There is no place in all of God's Word where you are regenerated by personal faith. It doesn't happen. You are regenerated by the Word of God or by the will of God, but not by anything you do. You're not born physically by anything you do. You're not born spiritually by anything that you do. That is regeneration. That's the work of God. After He's regenerated you, He now asks that you trust Him and to believe Him and that faith comes through hearing and hearing through the Word of God. That, f that faith is given to you so that you might trust Him and believe Him. People tell me, you know, how much they trust and love the Lord, and then and then something happens, something something hits. They lose their job, a child dies, they they flip their pickup going too fast around a curve on a back country road, like I did once. I, I don't know, something happens. They have a disaster, and they're at their wit's end. A spouse leaves. You know, how how are they gonna live? How are they gonna what are they gonna do? You know, what have I done wrong that this happened to me? Why is God picking on me and not on other people? I mean, those are all terrible, terrible thoughts. Why can't the thought be, all right, Lord, you're the one who loves me. You're the one who died in my place. I trust you. No matter what comes, I trust you. Dearly beloved, no wonder there's a peace that passes understanding. No wonder there's a joy that's unspeakable. Those who are not Christ's don't have that. They don't have a total assurance that God loves them and nothing touches their lives that, that doesn't come through His program and His plan. So we are regenerated by the will of God, but we are rescued, saved, delivered because we're already alive and we trust Him that He's the one who's delivering us. Modern evangelism says if you want to be saved, you need to accept Christ as your own personal Savior, and you're now born again. That's not how you're born again. In no place do you have a passage of Scripture, not a single one, that says that you are born again if you do something, if, if you trust Him, if you believe in Him, if you accept Him, if you make Him Lord of your life or anything else. I've gone over this... Oh, and over this and over this again and again and again. It is important 
because we're talking about the gospel. It, it's important because God's people in the main don't know this simple biblical truth. I have been born again. It is a passive voice. I gave you the scriptures in one of our previous videos. By the will of God, not mine. Now, when I trust him, I'm delivered. I'm saved. And that salvation is a marvelous experience. How do you know the peace of God if you don't trust him? He has dedicated himself to give us that faith and that trust. We can't believe on our own. We are sheep who have gone astray, but we are his sheep. We are alive, and he gives us the faith to trust him and to believe him. He calls us lost sheep that were found. He came to seek and to save the lost. He came to seek and to save that which was his, that belonged to him. That's what this book says. Did he do what he came to do? Well, of course he did. He declared on the cross, it is finished. So he has regenerated us, and not only has he regenerated us, but he is rescuing us, saving us. We are his, and we have peace with God because we know a God who is in control, and who, just like he's in control and he establishes those kings and those in authority over us, a God who is in control, who directs our life, who will have, verse 4, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. This text does not say who will have all men to be regenerated. It doesn't say that. And you cannot take the word saved and say that that means regeneration. I've been told five times by the Holy Spirit that I was born from above by God, by the will of God, not by the will of the flesh, not by my own will, not by me, but by God. Not by faith, not by anything I did, not by acceptance, but by the will of God. Think about it. Where do you find a single passage of Scripture that says a goat ever became a sheep, or for that matter, a sheep ever became a goat? When you plant a seed, what do you get? You get what the seed was when you planted it. When you plant wheat, it's wheat. When you plant tare, it's tare. Nowhere in the Word of God is any indication ever given that tare would become wheat or wheat would become tare. It just doesn't happen. We are His people and we were regenerated by His will and the purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ is to deliver us, save us from sin who will have all men to, to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. A favorite verse, of course, of the Arminians. So let's translate it in a very popular way. Who wishes that all men would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So he's a loving, white-haired, elderly gentleman in heaven, sitting in his rocking chair, Wishing, oh, wishing, wishing so much that people would come to him and believe and be regenerated, born again. And that picture says that he's not sovereign and that we are not really born again by the will of God, as John chapter 1, verse 13 says. And that's why modern evangelists have to face the fact that obviously God can't be in control. Therefore, they make the statement that God never overrules man's will. So he wishes all men would be saved. First of all, I don't think you can do that with the word desires. That Thalo is the word in the Greek. God says whatsoever he desired, he did in heaven and earth and in all deep places. So if he desires this, he's going to do it. And of course he did do it. You can't get out of the force of the verse by simply saying that this is something God wishes would happen, but he can't make it happen. Because now we have much less than a sovereign God, and that is just unacceptable in this verse. You can't do that with the Greek word thalo. Some people translate it wish, 
But you can't separate God's wish from God's desire because whatsoever it pleased God to do, that he did. So if this is what he wishes, that's what he does. Secondly, we have all men. Well, does that mean every single human that ever lived? Well, obviously, that can't be true. Cain is called one who was an enemy of God. Judas is called the son of perdition. Jezebel is called one who was against God more than any human who ever lived. And clearly, there are those who are going to be in hell. And then in, in the book of Revelation, we clearly see the beast and the false prophet. These are humans. The beast and the false prophet are not angelic creatures. The beast in the book of Revelation is a world ruler who takes control of the entire earth, and he's a human, and he is put in the lake of fire in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation. So you can't say that all men are going to be delivered and come to the full knowledge of the truth. And that, and that that means every single human who ever lived. It can't mean every person that ever lived. Like God sits there and, and wishes that, that all men be redeemed. First of all, the words don't say that he wishes all men to be redeemed. He doesn't use that word. He uses the word saved. So it can't mean that. Secondly, we know from Scripture that there are unredeemed people. We know there are sons of the devil. When the parable was spoken, it's our Lord who said that the wheat are the sons of the kingdom, the tare are the sons of the devil, the sons of the evil one. I didn't say that. God did. Are there sons of the devil? Absolutely. And the lake of fire is prepared for the devil and his messengers, and he raised his messengers, even his messengers of light, so it can't mean that God wishes all men are redeemed. It just, it just can't mean that. God desires that all men be saved. And the meaning of this word all has to be determined by the context, folks. It rarely, if ever, means everyone or everything. Does God will that all men who ever lived from Adam until the end of time be rescued? That doesn't fit Scripture. It can't be. That would say there's no hell. To say there's no hell is to directly deny clear statements of Scripture. Our Lord Jesus Christ says more about hell than he does about heaven. So everyone is not going to be rescued. If God wishes that everybody who ever lived was rescued, well, then he's a very, very poor God because he wishes, he desires something that he can't bring to pass. But God does what He desires. What is will? If you go to a dictionary, you'll find, you'll find out that a synonym of will is desire. To say God wills is to say God desires that all men be saved. And to say that God desires that all men be saved is to say that He will save them. So if we say that all men here means everybody who's ever lived, well, we got a huge problem. We have to assume that there's no hell and that the scriptures that deal with hell are, are not true, and, and I can't do that. In Ephesians, we have a passage of scripture that says, In whom we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. And we just read, God wills that all men be saved. If he works all things after the counsel of his own will, is this one thing he isn't going to work? You can't have that contradiction. Please, dearly beloved, don't come to a meaning that contradicts other scriptures. We also are told that no man can come unto me except to be given him of the Father. If he wills that everybody come, why don't they all come to him? So that doesn't work. Let's look at another possibility. He means that all men at some time in the future would be saved and come to a full knowledge of the truth. Well, that's not too bad. There, there wouldn't be any contradiction then with other scripture. I mean, if I told you that I was running for president of the United States and I will that every man have a million dollars, you would understand that completely. You would never suggest that I meant all the people who died in the past get a million dollars or those in China 
you would know that I meant everybody in the United States. So you would limit the all men there as anyone would in their conversation. So it, it could very well mean that. The scripture says that all Israel is going to be saved and that the eternal state is for only those who are elect and redeemed. No pain, no suffering, no tears, no crying. So yeah, the, the, there will come a time when all men will be delivered and come to a knowledge of the truth. So that may not be too bad a meaning. And that may be the meaning. I'm not saying it is, and I don't know. But there is another possibility, and that is that he means that he wills that all different kinds of men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So here again, there wouldn't be any contradiction with other scripture. Because that appears to be in harmony with the first two verses. Kings and those in authority. So there are different kinds of men that he wills to be saved. And we know that he has some from every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. There's a study in and of itself there. There are those who have never had an opportunity to accept Christ. But they're his. He died in their place. And children would be included in that group as well. So it's possible to take all men as not all men without exception, but all men of distinction, men of different nations, different places of authority, all kinds of men. So that also works. I think it's sort of up to you whether you think he's speaking futuristically, that, that it's God's purpose that in the future all men will be delivered, rescued, and come to the knowledge of the truth, because that's absolutely certain. As we reach the end of the book of Revelation, we know clearly that there's a time when all men will be delivered and come to a knowledge of the truth. Not all men who lived, but all men at that time. So it could be that meaning as well. But what it does not mean, what it does not mean, is God is hopelessly wishing every person would be regenerated because he relinquished his sovereign will supplanting the will of man in its place, making man sovereign. That is what the verse does not mean. What cannot work is the Arminian approach that God sits up there and wishes that all men would come to him and be regenerated, to be redeemed. That one cannot work. It is anti-biblical, and it, it absolutely blasphemes the character of the sovereign God who redeems his people and rescues his people from the devastating effects of Adam's fall. I love you all. I truly do. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.